So I'm Greg Reeve. I'll be the facilitator for this session. Um, we're going to have uh, invited speakers from the Library of Congress to give us some presentations. Specifically, we're going to see four presentations today, and then after their presentations, we'll have some Q&A time at the end. I'll go ahead and introduce each of the four speakers, and then I'll turn it over to them. So first, we have Nate Trail. He's a digital project coordinator, librarian, and programmer for the Library of Congress, where he's worked for more than 27 years. He's been active in library standards work for more than 18 years, working on BibFrame, Nets, Mods, Primus, and Alto data standards and various digital library implementations using those standards. He's worked on the linked data site, id.loc.gov, almost from the beginning. More recently, he's been leading the team that is building a test bed for the library's BibFrame catalog pilot, which converts data from the authorities and bibliographic records to create BibFrame descriptions, develops and tests workflows for new and converted cataloging descriptions, and makes new connections to other authoritative sources. Um, Kevin Ford is a librarian, linked data technical specialist at the Library of Congress, where he's worked from 2010 to 2014 in the Network Development and Mark Standards Office. He currently works on BibFrame, focusing recently on how best to bring efficiency to the library's BibFrame data set for the purposes of scale. Sally McCollum, she's our third speaker. She's the chief of the Network Development and Mark Standards Office at the Library of Congress. After years of work with many bibliographic standards, and especially MARC, which plays a central role for today's data interchange, Sally is deeply into BibFrame from vocabulary to implementation as a component of tomorrow's data interchange. And then last, we have Matt Miller. He's a librarian, linked data specialist at the Library of Congress. So we'll, let me, let's give them a warm welcome. And we'll turn it over to So because we had already started working with METS and XML, we had systems in place that could handle our EFXML. Um, so we're using MarkLogic Server, and it's document-based as opposed to a pure triple store. But uh, MarkLogic does have the ability to index as though you were in a triple store. So parts of our data is our EF triples, and parts of it is just a solar-like um, full keyword indexing or whatever we want to do um, and make it up for ourselves. We also have the luxury of having our own um, authority system, so we can host vocabularies that we trust because we know we built them. Um, and then we have uh, interactions with the regular ILS, so we have daily records coming from the name authority file and from the bibliographic records. And we also built the uh, RDF editor, and that's using the JavaScript. So the basic system that we have is um, a base catalog that consists of name title records that we converted to works and uh, bibliographic records that we converted to works and instances. And every day we get new records from both of those sources and we get catalogers, about 40 something catalogers, who are doing either new descriptions or uh, pulling records out of the system for enhancement, like. Uh, things from our SIP program or vendor records from overseas. Um, and because we have to be able to produce MARC records on the side, those catalogers also have to key in um, the record, the, their records in the ILS, so there's a duplicate key. So um, 
some of the tensions that our systems have created is that um, when you convert from mark to bit frame using our converter, you're creating RDFXML in a particular serialization. And when you're creating records in the editor, you're doing a different serialization, JSON to me. And it's converted back to RDFXML so that it plays nicely with the bulk of our records. Um, the edited records also look substantially different because we have a lot more URIs. The catalogers will use pick lists and store the URIs as opposed to having uh, verbose converted records. And uh, converted records are notoriously duplicative because there's data in you know, 07 and 08 that is mirrored or slightly mirrored uh, in higher level fields. Another huge tension is that um, nothing is really settled yet. Um, the ontology changes, the PFLC changes because we are finding that it's impossible to do our work the way we, it, it currently sits. Uh, the conversion changes as we discover errors. And uh, catalogers are actively asking us for changes in editor profiles. And the way we ingest and link to things is always changing too. <clears throat> so we had to build a system that would uh, allow us to take in records from the ILS. But once you've edited it, it's stored in, in the different database as the new way of doing things. And so you don't want it to come back in again. So if someone accidentally edits it again in the ILS, it has to be blocked. So we had to build a system that would block some records but not block others. And then the concert system people said, well, we actually don't want them to come back in again because somebody from outside edited it after I edited it in the picture. So now we're having to figure out ways to allow certain records in and not allow others. And because um, we don't really have a way of getting the records from BibFrame back to Mark yet. The catalogers really want to be able to say, well, I created my name authority record in the BibFrame catalog. Why can't that be exported now? And oh, some of their supervisors are tired of them double key. So we are working on BibFrame to Mark, which should um, alleviate some of that, but it causes its own headaches because then we are now, we're, we're focusing on how does this bid for a record fit mark as opposed to how does this bid for a record sit in the world. And so uh, that is a focus that we kind of regret, but we have to be able to produce mark, and so we're, we have to deal with it. Um, so we might have to be storing things in a bid for a record that don't make sense there, but do make sense in the mark world. There's a lot of URIs. Do they all go elegantly into mark? Probably not. <laughs> if you're converting from different to mark, are you taking a work in all of its instances and all of its items and creating one mark record? Are you creating one for each instance with its works? Are you creating a work mark record and an instance mark record? All these questions we have not answered yet. Do we need more LCCNs to help us distinguish between various instances? So when we first started this, we were um, ingesting records and merging them together if there was a 240 or 130 with the same title string, name title string. Um, and it seemed like a good idea at the time, and it often does work well. But um, if you have a, a work that has an illustrator or a translator, the work itself is thrown away because it doesn't belong in the original work. And so a lot of our um, metadata elements would be dropped. So I don't think we're going to it's also really hard to determine, if you load a record, what's the original work to, to link to. You may have many that have the same time. And if you're loading a million records at a time, even if you've loaded them in the exact right order, you might be loading them on separate servers, and so they're not in at exactly the same time in order to link a record. So here's an example where merging did seem to work. These are all different manifestations of all the film. And they all merged onto what was a name title record in the one that we found. So our new our new idea is that we're going to load everything that we have into the same database and load it as raw bit frame, and then uh, link it and resolve URIs separately, so that um, everything in the database knows about everything else as soon as you click on it. 
So it'll fire off questions that says, what's related to me? What do I relate to? What's my URI if I just have a label? And what is my label that I'm a ye if I just have the URI? Another thing we want to do is try not to get too far ahead of the catalogers because they're the ones that put in the 130 and the 240 and they put it in the way they wanted it to be. So we shouldn't second guess that. On the editor side, we have been sort of like Wild West um, editing records. We allow catalogers to either create a new description or edit an existing one. They can load from a different source. Um, and we weren't really keeping track of what kind of a transaction this is. Um, about the only rule we had was you have to have a title and you have to have an LCCN if you want to post back to the database. So, um, one of the decisions that we made was to um, name everything with a, with a C plus the Voyager ID, and then when you edit it and save it back, you save it under the LCCN. And because of this Wild West, we're never really sure, in some cases, what's the intent of the cataloger? Is he trying to replace this record or clone it? And so some of those are being mismatched and we're screwing up our records. So the new approach for editing is to um, make sure that every profile, every workflow is flagged correctly so that when it gets ingested into the database, we know the type of transaction that it's trying to do. And we're trying to make the edits as small as possible so you don't have a massive payload multiple works and instances that may or may not be written together correctly. And we might just say, if you pull something out of the, of the database, when you push it back, it stays the same, and you wipe out whatever you have there. Um, we'll, see, we'll see if that decision goes or not. On URIs, um, some of this stuff is solved for us because there are unique identifiers in the records, but if there's a, an instance that has an LCCN and it has an 856, there isn't really an LCCN for that electronic version of this record. So unless you use a version of the LCCN or something else, um, you don't really have a reliable URI for that thing. So we have to do some more thinking about that. Um, Kevin's going to talk a little bit about ma uh, making URIs with uh, hashes of any title. Um, and Using, uh, maybe actually even trying to establish more LCC as I said before. So uh, going forward, we do have the intent to uh, not just have our good friend works and instances in a big file on a dlo.gov, but actually to be referenceable online. Uh, and that should be ready by ALA in June. Um, fingers crossed. It's going to look basically like a, an authority record. It'll have the same label lookup and the resolution services. There'll be feeds to tell you what the latest records are and all that. We're going to go more full steam ahead with BitFrame and Mark development as soon as we get out of the um, push BitFrame online. And we recognize that RDA is changing, and so we're going to have to be flexible to handle whatever that brings us. And we're also really trying to focus on the idea of if you converted a record from Mark and it has this big raw, lots of blank nodes payload, can you simplify that to just what a triple star wants to see, such a predicate object? And so we're really actively working with that. And you'll hear more about that from Kevin. And here's a picture of my kid who's appropriately skeptical of <laughs> <laughs>
talked several times, uh, use anonymous resources and blame nodes interchangeably, we're talking about the same thing. You can see then, um, or I should say the lack of an identifier relatively easily. Uh, there are two examples here. Both are identical in every way except for the top one has been uh, clearly identified with an HTTP URI, which is preferred um, in LinkedIn realm. And the lower one makes use of, is, is an anonymous resource. And the anonymous resource in this case is the topic, um, which is highlighted in blue. It does have an identifier, but it's kind of a system identifier. If you look at this data, the same exact RDF in a different serialization, you can see that blank node or the identifier more clearly. The top example is again the RDF that uses an HTTP URI. Um, you can see it begins with the ID, download, dug up, so on and so forth. The lower one in this uh, snippet of intervals has an identifier that begins underscore colon NE3 AE2, so on and so forth. The, that is an identifier that was given to it by the system that produced this serialization. Um, the identifier, and that is basically the main difference between an anonymous resource and otherwise um, first-class identified resource. So to sum up, RDF resources um, may be identified by a URI or a blank note. Um, resources identified by a URI are, of course, the ones that are preferred. And that's because those HTTP URIs are shareable, they're usable beyond a specific system, and they're very readily reusable within a specific, a specific system. Resources identified by blank nodes, on the other hand, um, are not shareable, the link nodes itself is not shareable, um, it's not usable beyond a specific system, and it's not really reusable within a specific system. And that little asterisk um, means that I'm using, I'm talking about a system, it's technically the graph, but for all intents and purposes, think of it as the system. That, that identifier is system specific and really is unusable outside of that. It's not exactly shareable, and that's the big deal, um, the problem with uh, not using HTTP URLs. <coughs> Anonymous resources and blank nodes get a bad rap, uh, but they are a fact of life, period. We didn't create them, um, Link Data didn't create them. In fact, they're written into the RDF spec. When they, when they devised the RDF specification, they recognized that not everything would be able to be neatly identified with an HTTP URI or a, uh, or a URI period, and had to create the concept of an anonymous resource identified by a link. We also just see them as part of the process. Our raw transformations, the transformations that take a mark a record and convert it into various bit frame resources, um, almost very frequently produce blank notes uh, or anonymous resources. Um, and that for the very simple reason that we do not have HTTP URIs that are in the mark records. Um, we have to do something. And either that is produce a raw bit frame record that, or resource that does not have, um, or that makes use of anonymous resources, mint an HTTP URI which has its own problems, or some combination of the, of the two, which is to try to look up everything as you're doing the conversion, which can be um, a big hit to, to, to an active system at that moment in time. And finally, I would ask just generically, should everything really have a URI? HTTP URI are commitments. If you admit that URI, the assumption is you're going to um, you're going to, to okay, you're going to honor that URI. You're going to be able to take that URI, stick it to a browser, or perform a curl command on it, and find out what that URI, that HTTP URI means. Uh, which is why I say that they are they, they're not costless. They are a commitment. You need to be able to manage them. So, despite the fact that I'm fairly thin about anonymous resources. They have been um, my particular bugaboo of late for, uh, for a variety of different reasons. Number one is that I think it's important to give strong identity to those things that require strong identity. Using anonymous resources results in a tremendous amount of duplicate um, data resources in the system, or, or for all intents and purposes, duplicate resources in the system. The number of anonymous resources um, are causing or will cause performance and scaling issues as we continue on down this path. And finally, BitFrame, like Mark, is, is principally about exchanging bibliographic information. Slimmer, more concise, more reusable resources are therefore better for exchange. So, 
with all of that said, we started looking at our data set and saying, what can we do about all of these anonymous resources? We identified three areas, um, or we could categorize the work into three different sections. Um, number one, evaluate where the data are coming from with respect to transformation from the mark. Um, is the data in mark controlled? Um, if it is, is there a published list already that we could be that we could be taking advantage of and embed into the conversion process? Can, examples of this are things that you might find in Mark 06 or 07 or 08, which has encoded data. And you know, I just took this screenshot of one of those sections from the Mark documentation, demonstrating that the, the third character position for for playback speed. Um, you can see that this is all coded data. Interestingly, we did not have this published at ID.lib.gov, so we had no URI for it, despite how controlled that data is, even in the mark. So the solution is to take some of that information and publish new lists at ID.lib.gov, so we actually have the URIs to use in our, our, in our bibliographic bit frame data. Uh, these new lists will include, <coughs> are not limited to playback speed, map projection, map relief, reduction ratio, which comes from 07 script, which comes from 08, tape config, and and a, a number of others. Another thing we discovered is that we do have a list published at ID, but we weren't making use of it necessarily. Or we were making use of it, but we hadn't caught up. Um, our process hadn't caught up to, to, to where we were um, at the conversion level. Uh, so one of the things we asked ourselves is, does the conversion make use of a published list? Does the conversion suggest a new list should be created? Um, this little snippet is actually from the conversion where you can see tape config there, or tape width. You can see they're taking the coded values and creating a string um, from it. This suggests that the, the conversion has no idea that there's a URI for it, perhaps one needs to, it needs to exist. So the solution um, is, like I said a moment ago, is to create those URIs. But the other thing that we discovered is that in the conversion code, there are, in fact, a lot of places where the conversion will now output an HTTP URI. That code was released in February. It is marked to BitFrame 2, version 1.4. And most of our converted data in our internal system is pre-1.4 release. So we don't have these URIs even in our own data right now. So, of course, a simple solution to that is to rerun everything through the conversion um, and reload it into our system. Finally, Evaluate BitFrame data based on resource type um, and ask these questions, you know, are the values controlled or somewhat controlled that we're seeing? Is there a high degree of repetition that we're finding? How many resources are we discussing? What's the level of effort involved to identify and publish them? Um, and again, I pull out this example of this subject heading, this topic, as you can see, because it does not have an HTTP URI, it is, a, it is a, um, an anonymous resource. Uh, with the heading of sisters dash correspondence, which is not in id.lib.gov. So there is no URI for this concept right now. Uh, one of the questions is, what do we do with this? And subjects are absolutely on the table. Um, there are other fields, though, too. Providers, publishers, manufacturers, distributors, and producers. Again, oft-repeated information, no URIs current. Roles. There's a great deal of variation in our systems for roles and relationships. An intended audience, we discovered, is, again, one of those fields that has tremendous overlap from record to record to record, but not necessarily um, captured right now in some kind of way that we could really take uh, huge technological use of. So we're going through this, um, and uh, we're finding even more. I forgot about this slide. <clears throat> Many more. Uh, so font size, operating system, system required programming language. The values in our data for these are very, very small, which is why they're not necessarily huge. And to explain what those percentages are, is that we have begun this work. We have started taking this data out of one system <coughs> and creating URIs for it. Those percentages, I'm not entirely sure how to phrase this, but those percentages either, pr pr either demonstrate how much overlap there was or how much we were able to reduce the number of anonymous resources into HTTP URIs. Uh, font size is an extreme example. I'll, I'll keep, uh, show you a better depiction of how extreme an example that is in a moment. But suffice it to say that we were able to extract all the publishers, manufacturers, distributors, and producers, and we were able to extract X number of, of resources from one system and 
identified that only 85% of those sent, uh, or were 85% of those were overlapping. There was at least one often multiples. How did we do this? Uh, we basically created a MapReduce system, or um, it's a system we use in a MapReduce process. I'm not entirely sure how to, how to look at this. But to give it some kind of graphical representation, we take information out of the VDF database, uh, which, was, which Nate was just talking about, and we copy it over into LDS staging. When we do that, we extract the unique values that we can identify um, in the VDF database and load them into LDS staging. From LDS staging, we then perform some additional normalization on them before we move them into id.load.gov. So going back to font size uh, in an extreme example, we discovered there were 36,000 plus anonymous resources in the VF database for font size. When we extracted all of the unique values on a lot of the labels for font size, which is found in some 3xx field, right? I don't know which one right now. There were seven unique values on the 36,000. Um, and because of essentially various spellings of the word large, or I should say various misspellings of the word large, <laughs> I was able to further reduce that down to three. Um, and arguably I could reduce it down to two, but we're, I won't go into that kind of detail, but, um, but this is the type of, of work that we're doing. Uh, you can see the same type of process with providers. Uh, we took 5 million out of the BF database. Uh, the unique values went down to 934,000 plus. And again, we're doing some additional normalization to that. We were able to reduce that number down to 814,000. It's still a very large data set. Um, overnight, providers became the second largest data set in ID. Um, it's double the size of LCSH, for example. But to give you an example, uh, to, to show you example of how this works, I, here's a screenshot of Hogwarts Racing Company. You'll see the main label at the top uh, in bold, and then down below a number of variants. All of those variants represent what I was able to algorithmically identify were essentially Hogwarts Race and Company. Um, and through those normalization routines, merge them together so that when we published this resource at id.load.gov, we published one resource with one, one HTTP URI that represented all of those variations. Um, the moment we put this into id.load.gov, we can take advantage of the various services we have up there, such as label resolution service, the suggest service, to help us um, resolve the streams in our raw bit frame data into HTTP URIs. One of the neat things that happened with some of these normalization routines is that it identified small variations and even non-Latin uh, script representations. So each one of those, as you can see there, is a, a very slight difference in the Arabic and how it was coded into the mark that once the normalization routines were applied, all merged together. This interestingly points out one small detail that we will to do is in, which will involve reloading the, the provider's file, is the conversion does not take into account 880, mark 880s. So if there's a 260 that has a matching 880, what we would like to do is actually merge all that together, um, but we're not doing that now, which is why you see no Latin representation of this, of this publisher, yes, publisher. Anyway, once um, it's in the data, it has an HTTP URI, and you can see that HTTP URI um, associated with that agent at the bottom of that little snippet of RDF. Apologies to those in the back. So where to from here? Um, what we're doing provides a basis for publishing bibliographic data set. Uh, what Nate was talking about, that June ALA, June deadline uh, that we're looking at. And the idea is to load the rawish bit frame works and instances of ID and then generally generate the relationships on demand by querying the system internally, which is exactly how ID.load.gov operates right now. So we're actually really pleased with this, with this approach right now because what you see when you when you see all those links um, in LCSH and names with the little blue line underneath, all of those are being established on the fly at the time you request that, that view. Um, 
So this is exactly how it works now. We've actually taken this map reduce system to a new level, um, and we're looking at actually generating um, hubs or kind of stub work resources um, from from the data set, from the MARC data set directly. So these would come out of MARC law, law authority 100, 110, 111, 130, and the various 6xx and 7xx fields in the MARC bid, um, and load them into the system. But there are, of course, many other things that still need to be discussed. We need to figure out names, any, any, any uncontrolled names, subjects, or another biggie. Uh, I can tell you right now that we have roughly 30 million in, in the in uniques. We have 30 million subjects in our bid file, more or less. I can't remember exactly how many of them are unique. Somewhere between five and eight. Um, do you give each one every single one of those an HTTP or I, um, even invalid ones? Um, lots and lots of questions. The other questions we're starting to ask is that we should there be small model tweaks to help accommodate this? So font size doesn't need to be its own bona fide resource. Or could that get away with a, a note, for example? Uh, but again, these are all unanswered questions. And although most of what I talked about is coming, uh, and uh, if I see if you saw the graphic that says it's going into id.load.gov, it is going into id.load.gov, but it happens to be an internal copy right now. There is a public uh, data set that we put out there in January when we're working through the proof of concept of this, uh, which you can find at the address above. So, thank you so much. have been telling you about uh, some of these things uh, that they reflect in the whole mark bit frame uh, going back and forth to, between those two data formats. Um, I want to uh, uh, hit on several issues, uh, the challenge, but mostly the challenges that we're encountering and how we're dealing with some of them, and finally uh, the, what we have uh, at the end of the ripple effects that keep coming up that because we keep changing everything. <laughs> um, so, um, why do we have these um, uh, conversions? The obvious one is we don't want to leave our, our database behind. I don't know if it was clear to you, but everything we do when we're working in our BitFrame pilot system the catalogers are working with our whole database. We've, we've converted all 19 million into BitFrame works and instances. And we're not looking at a, a small, small, small uh, subset. And uh, so we, that's how we see things. We've seen things from the beginning is that we had to be able to see how this worked when you're working with the whole file. Um, there are ILS, our ILS is mark based as I think most, if not all, of yours are, and uh, and we have many auxiliary systems. Sometimes some of them are big, some of them are very small. They just process a little bit of something and then they, then they feed it into the uh, main ILS. But but there are a lot of those that would have to be changed in order to uh, uh, be able to say go all good uh, We have uh, we inter we load internally. And we create internally mark records constantly, and I think Nate uh, referred to some of that. That uh, we have we have 100 catalogers in our pilot, but we have 200 catalogers making mark only, and so those are constantly coming into that database. They have to go into the BitFrame file because the catalogers who are doing BitFrame cataloging need to be able to see everything, and so we. As a result, we have this double keying going on, and that can't continue. Uh, our our uh, supervisors have said that can't continue, and our cataloging chiefs have said that can't continue. And so, we're as we're trying to increase the number of pilot participants, we've got to get down. We've got to get it so that they only key into the uh, BitBrain database. But, and we also. Uh, intend to provide mark mark data for all of you for the community uh, 
on into the future as long as it's needed. So the challenges, uh, the, um, one of them is uh, the data model issue when we're, tra when we're talking about Mark to BibFrame and BibFrame back to Mark. Uh, the, uh, I think I can do better without my glasses. Uh, the, uh, the MARC authority records go, we make BibFrame work records with them, the MARC bibliographic records, some of it goes into the uh, BibFrame uh, uh, work records, some of it goes into BibFrame instance records. In those instance records, we split actually out, for instance, for a book, we would split the print and the electronic, which we put into one MARC record, but we make it into two instance records uh, attached to that work record. But then when we go back to, to Mark, what are we going to do? Do we take back the uh, print, BibFrame print instance, to one BibFrame record, uh, Mark record, and the BibFrame electronic to another one? Or do we try to recombine them? We're not, we, we don't see ourselves trying to recombine them. That's, that's, um, uh, would be too difficult and too subject to uh, a lot of um, maybe confused data. Uh, but we've also got the, the BibFrame work information that we had put, that we split out of the BibFrame authority, the BibFrame, Bib, the MARC Bib record. And that has got to go into the BibFrame, the MARC Bib records, some of that. But then what do we do with the uh, BibFrame work record? Do we carry it somehow back into the MARC environment? so that when we, if we wanted to go back into BibFrame with that record because it had been changed by a cataloger who was not in the pilot and blah, 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 uh, do we, do we uh, make it so that it's easier to go in, back into the BibFrame uh, environment because we have that work record? We also find that we don't, that resource types, that there are actually a number of models for them. They're not all just weenies. I know we, in our community, we like to talk about that and we use that very casually, but it's not true. And so uh, we have our mass-produced books, and they are pretty weeny. They, they work well with that. But we have a lot of unique material. And the unique material, that the, they, they may be the, several of the same thing, but they, they, um, uh, uh, they actually are all different works. Uh, but we have multiple carriers. Our, our um, AV catalogers are actually going down to the item level to keep all those carriers together because they're not going to make a separate work for a separate instance for each one of those carriers. And then we have the evolving or diachronic works in the new RDA terminology for serials and the ISSN International Center has, and the LRM are making a new way to look at the serials. Uh, we have a number of input streams. Uh, we have various sources. We've got those 200 catalogers who are not in the pilot, who are doing those MARC records. We've got the Library of Congress foreign offices. We have about six, seven, seven, six or seven foreign offices where they do cataloging and then they, they uh, uh, send it back to, to the library. They are beginning to, we're beginning to train them to be in the pilot so that at the India office, for instance, the Delhi office, might have two catalogers that actually are in the pilot and do uh, 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 print cataloging and, and mark cataloging. Uh, we have vendors supplied records. The, those are what we call IBC or Initial Bibliographic Control. And we, have, we get 55,000 records a year from those vendors. And they come into the system and they are, are, are transformed. They come in as mark. They're transformed into BibFrame, and then they're used by the BibFrame catalogers to, in fact, uh, fill out and, and, and expand and make it to a record. Uh, and then we have copy cataloging that comes in from a marked stream, and we have the concert of CLC relationship, which uh, our, many of our serial catalogers do work in OCLC. It comes back into us in a marked stream. And then we have the editor. The editor, we're constantly adjusting because we're looking at, we look at the, uh, uh, what's coming out of the conversion, and we want, we, it's got to match what's coming out of the editor. And these things developed in, in different ways, and so they, we, we, we're now trying to get them to, to develop, to, to go together. Uh, then, <clears throat> for, for the mark to bid frame issues, 
we have had dupl we have duplication all over the wire format, as everybody knows. Uh, sometimes people only uh, don't duplicate and only fill in one place, but a lot of the Library of Congress catalogers have always filled in every place that they were supposed to fill in the data. But you get a lot of different kinds of things uh, in, in that duplication. You get, uh, uh, for instance, Italy might be in there as a note, as a code, as a typo, as a transcription, Italy with an IE. Uh, you might have, you have coded data fields that have a code, like the uh, language code, and then you have the 041, if you have a second language, you, you repeat it there. And so in, in a straight con uh, conversion from MARC to BitFrame, we end up with two uh, uh, resources that have, have been converted. <coughs> we also have things that we ignore, which is, uh, I think, a positive, and that, that we no longer use this timeline of entry in the 210 field, and so we don't take it into BitFrame, it will not come back into MARC. Uh, we have non-Latin in the big frame environment. We are, our target is to transcribe, for transcribed data in the instance to only be in the script of the resource. Uh, but we have the, all those internet IBC, those uh, uh, initial bibliographic control records, they are all transliteration only. And so we have 55,000 transliterated records that already come in. Do we throw away that transliteration or do we check it? Because it, it, transliteration is very, uh, it, it's, it's an art, not a science, it turns out. And uh, so uh, there's a lot of variation and you try to standardize it as much as you can by having your catalogers check it all. Uh, so our target with, for the big frame to mark is to use, is to not use the 880s, to minimize the use of the 880s. And we're still working on this issue. Uh, keeping to our eyes, uh, fields that have a dollar zero uh, in them are fairly safe for the URIs, but um, when we need a URI at the subfield level, and there are several places we do, but subjects are one of the key ones, you, we need to do something. And we're thinking of doing, we're thinking of putting in a, a construct because we want to keep the URIs when we go into MARC. Uh, we, want, we don't want to have to uh, identify the URI again if we take it back into BitFrame. And we want to be able to give it to you if you are interested in getting it. And uh, so we're thinking of doing something like a data separator a URI within the subfields. We'll figure out something, but we may have to do something ad hoc. And we realize that. Uh, creating a 007, we're very fortunate in that many with the RDA, many 007 uh, character, um, positions actually have a variable field uh, and, uh, analog. And so we can, we just use the variable field analog. We probably in the end won't have very many 007s. We'll simply all, they will all be not duplicated, but only in the, uh, in the variable field. And the 008, which is a key one, of course, we have to, we have to generate that. But there's still bytes in the 008 that we will probably put in the, bring back into MARC in a variable field rather than in the 008. But there will be 008s in the records. Punctuation, we, in the, in the uh, big frame environment, we don't put punctuation, very much punctuation. So when we come back into MARC, it will, we won't have punctuation to some field boundaries in general. And we have uh, a lot of uh, problems with data mixtures. The 040 in the MARC format says that you use some, uh, a code from the MARC a list. And if we have that, we could make all URIs for all of the uh, uh, institution organizations that are listed in the 040. But in fact, people don't use that. They use OCLC codes, they use German codes, they use other, other codes. And so uh, we have to get around that. And we have that issue in other fields also. Uh, we have data that was recorded using different rules, and even today it is, because our, our, for instance, our prints and photographs area uh, uses AMIM for the uh, uh, description, and then they use the uh, uh, RDA for the uh, uh, data access points. Uh, we have data that was converted from cards in different ways. They were either keyed at, in Scotland, or they were keyed are, are they, and then some of those are run through OCLC to see if they can pull out somebody else's key and all sorts of ways that we have done retrospective conversion over the years. 
And then we have marked changes. We, we uh, duplicated the 260 with the 264. And in BitFrame, we do have the information for the 264. So when we come back into MARC, we won't have a 260. We will use the 264s. So we have an ongoing challenge. We have this uh, ripple effect of the changes. If you have RDA changes, which we're just about to have now, uh, we have an impact on MARC. We have then an impact on the MARC conversion to BitFrame. And we have an impact on BitFrame and then an impact on the frame to mark. And that, that chain of, of, of changes and corrections is, is, uh, is very costly for trying to move things forward and do something new. But so far, the good frame to mark records that we have been getting, that we have been trying to generate, have been structurally sound. Uh, that doesn't mean the data is like you like it. Uh, the URIs in BibFrame uh, will be carried into MARC. We, we have, our, our BibFrame is rich in URIs. We will bring those into, into MARC. Uh, there will be uh, more variable fields and fewer coded data fields. And uh, there will be no punctuation in subfield boundaries. There will be less duplication. So those are both positives. Um, they will be cleaner in some ways because some of those data elements that we, uh, we ignore because they're no longer used and should, should be thrown out, but we don't ever throw anything out, uh, we, they, they will be uh, defaulted, essentially. Uh, we, we hope that we will have simpler non Latin. And finally, um, our, uh, which is what the question I always get, is our target date for having this finished is in September because that's when we want to ramp up to more catalogers doing good frame. And that's when Richard Wiggins says he's not going to can't do that if they have to double key. So with that, thank you. And I'll turn it over to Matt. Do we need all of these fields? 
Um, and so we have a feature that allows the catalog of the user to come in and disable certain fields on a particular profile. And so this is only visible to them, and it's only on their workstation, but then they can kind of really fine grain how they want their profile to, to work um, for their process. So those are the kind of big three things that we've done. Um, these updates are, are live at the Big Firm Network's FE site if you want to take a look. And that's it. Thanks. Okay, hey, thanks for your presentations. Uh, if you guys, if you four can come to our hot seats here, and uh, we'll open it up for questions. We have uh, about 10 minutes, nine minutes for questions. So if you have questions, there's a mic roaming. So in the LD4P um, context, there's the Synopia editor that was based on the underlying code of the Bitframe editor from LC. Are these two um, systems undergoing concurrent development in a coordinated way or in a completely separate way? Um, so there's definitely influences between, uh, so we're looking at the Snowflake Editor and when it's available we're definitely going to look to it to adopt some of its features and see what we can borrow. Um, it, the, the features you saw here are just kind of like must-haves for our catalogers working today. Um, so these are kind of just like bare minimum updates that we're trying to keep the system going for the pilot. And let me say, I don't think we need one edit, I don't think it it's positive to have only one editor in the universe. We need, I think what, what they're doing and what we're doing are going to be a, a number of ideas that can, can be used to find another group that doesn't editor. I had a question about something that Nate and Sally, I think, both said about the data that was being created by the editor and the data that was being created by the converter being different. Can you unpack that a little bit? Um, yeah, first of all, it's differently serialized. And so um, in some cases, like from the editor, you will have, um, instead of having an EF work, you might have EF electronic resource or some other thing. And that is a work because it's a subclass of work. But in RDFXML, we've stored it as VF work because the converter always says the canonical uh, main class and has RDF type equals resource or something like that. So that's one simple way where the literal stuff means exactly the same thing, but literally it's, it's different, and so you have to convert it to make them equivalent. And sometimes we make mistakes. There was a letter sent by the European Different Task Force to the RDR technical committees. Um, asking for more uh, cooperation between RDA committees and Bigframe. And Do you know where, um, if there was an answer to that letter, or if they're working together now? Could you repeat the question, please? Yes. Last, last September, at the, the European Bigframe conference in Europe, there was a letter sent to the RDA technical committees asking for more cooperation between the two organizations. Do you know if there was an answer uh, that was sent back to the, uh, to the 
to that committee uh, if they're working together? That didn't, that didn't, um, that didn't gel very well. Uh, it's still uh, under discussion, and uh, I think there will be some uh, uh, communication, but uh, our, after all, RDA is a very different thing. They have, they have their own trajectory, they have their own things that they need to do with respect to the conceptual models that they use, and we are just trying to do a, a something, a format, or a, a container for exchange of data, and it's made using RDA and other rules. It is the case that QuickFrame um, mirrors RDA uh, a lot. I frankly think that was a mistake, but it had to be, it seemed like it had to be in time. We have a question in back, and then I'll bring it up. I'll bring it up right after. The, my question is for Kevin. Um, the, the work that you're doing on creating URRs for providers is a, is a welcome one, what you need to think. And I'm wondering if you, if you could unpack a little bit about how you do the processing. So how, how we do, how we do. How, how you arrive at the, the, um, the, the entity description for a provider. Um. Every, what I've discovered is that creating URIs is, only, is there's a lot of unique aspects depending on the source. So with publishers or providers, I should say, it's one of the more unique ones. We, um, we have an index in the BitFrame database system that indexes just whatever the 260A is. Um, and I take that list and then I figure out I do a query on the system to try to determine whether or not what I have happens to be a publisher, a distributor, a producer, or a manufacturer, um, so that I can ascribe a, the correct type to it. When it's, and that's just to get it into the, you know, the intermediary system. Going from the intermediary system, the other one, it's mostly a series of string replacements and regexes to try to normalize it. So there are little patterns um, that if you once you start looking at all the values in the 260, you can start trying to handle such as comma a division of. Um, and you can, I can't remember what I did, I'm pretty sure I took that phrase and anything after it and dropped, dropped it. Um, and kept the part that came before, for example. But there are a lot of little games like that, taking CO period and expanding it all the way out to company so that hardcore brace and CO will match up with hardcore brace and company. You take the and, the ampersand and convert to and, a whole bunch of little funny string stuff like that. Though. Answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think um, Sally will take it. Talking about taking Mark to be a friend and then taking that same data set back to Mark. And when we were meeting at midwinter, I was talking uh, about broad tripping data. And I was corrected to understand that Mark would be converted to BibFrame, and BibFrame would, would be converted to Mark, but it wouldn't be the same data. And that, so that if something was natively Mark, it would be converted to BibFrame. If something was natively BibFrame, it would be converted to Mark. Because it wouldn't be this idea of data going around and around the Ferris wheel um, idea so that you wouldn't, because it's, I guess don't know, like the use case would give the complexity of changing it back to Mark. I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that it goes around and around, uh, but, but you have something that has come from uh, a work and instance that have been generated from the Mark database, another instance is added from a good, good frame cataloger that you may take Take something, then you will bring something back in that has been in Mark before, and so there are there are all these funny situations. Okay. Yes. Uh, hello. My question is about this Arabic uh, publisher. It, uh, you mentioned you will be adding it in uh, the id.loc.gov. Are you planning to add non-Latin script? in the future, and uh, how about uh, 
less transliteration, less use of transliteration. You will not use it in the future. This is a plan or for the publishers. Uh, yes, or or the record. Well, they are not using translation in the future. Well, let's try to. Let me see if I can take those in in turn. So, with respect to the publishers or providers in general, um, we do we you know the transliterated ones are, or the the ones in the original script are, are in there. What we want to do is match them up the original script up to where they're transliterated, the transliterated ones, so that we have one URI for one entity, even though. We, they, they might have two labels um, in different scripts. Uh, what was the other two parts of the question? Uh, you mentioned that you will be moving to less transliteration in the big three. That's a question for you. You will be less transliteration in the Right. right. This is a very complicated and complex area. We, uh, we're, we talked about the transcription. You know, we know you. Because of the ISBG, you transcribe what you see on a piece. And so we want to, to try to limit transcription to just the what you see on the piece, which is the, the uh, script of the piece. However, we may also, we also have, as we have now, in the series of eight, each other country of publication, we uh, tell the year of publication in the series of eight, and we use that, that's commonly used, I think, for limitations within the system. So we're, we're looking at that plus the, uh, the uh, a, a more controlled version of the name of the publisher. And, and this is, there are a whole lot of things that we're looking at to make cataloging maybe more useful for retrieval and more faster and yet not complicated and make it slower for the cataloger uh, to in fact make records. We're bleeding into our break time. Let's take one more question and then we'll finish the session. Actually, I have two questions. One is a more technical question, but one's a broad one. So, given the interest of time, I'll ask the broader one. Um, I, I uh, appreciate the um, offer to, uh, at your expense, to convert good frame um, records back into. Mark, uh, for, as long as there's serious interest in the mark. Um, I feel that's a nice, soft approach for this um, big transition. What's your threshold? What is that? What does serious uh, interest in mark mean? It's, it's like I'm just asking because it's one of those chicken or egg things, right? Like, so long as there's mark, it's kind of where do we find it, the, the momentum to switch over to different? What are, what are the pressure factors that you think will happen to? get um, us to move over to to different. Something I was speaking of recently, you know, we, we transitioned from uh, uh, cards to mark, and the Library of Congress, I think, continued to produce cards for about 15 years. I don't know, Richard uh, might. At some, least 20. In 20 years we produced. And then we said there, there was less and less uh, volume that we needed, and also OCLC was, was had a way that they could produce more cards. So we didn't let the community down by saying, no, we're not going to do cards anymore. There are alternatives for it. Who knows? Maybe that's the way things will, will evolve in the future. Thanks, Sally, Kevin, Matt, Nate. Let's give them a round of applause.